gathering, so sign up, come down, and donate your time. It's part of the 12-step process of giving back. Right now, Pastor Scott's gonna be giving back and talking about, what are you gonna talk about? Confess, oh my gosh. We're in for a treat tonight. Which is what you did, you confessed your uh, nerves, so thank you for that. Hey, uh, good evening, I will introduce myself if you came in late, I'm Scott, I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, I'm in recovery from sex addiction, compulsive overeating. Hey, so tonight we were on Confess. That's crazy. So here's, here's the story. And uh, Matt, you can do the, the lights now if you have it all queued up. But um, this is kind of, when I was in high school, I would come home at night and uh, my mom would make me breathe in her face. And then she would ask me question after question after question, who was there? What'd you guys do? Where'd you guys go? Because this is before they had the tracking devices on you. And um, they would just grill. What'd you eat? What'd they eat? Well, was there anybody there that I didn't know? Should I know them? What were they wearing? And it was just question after question, and it was crazy. And it really felt like an interrogation. Felt like a huge interrogation. Maybe like this interrogation that we have on screen. Pay attention to the screens. You kid, why don't you spill your guts? Tell us everything. 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 Okay, I'll talk. <laughs> in third grade, I cheated on my history exam. In fourth grade, I stole my Uncle Max's toupee and I glued it on my face when I played Moses in my Hebrew school play. In fifth grade, I knocked my sister Edie down the stairs and I blamed it on the dog. But the worst thing I ever done, I mixed up all this fake puke at home and then I went to this movie theater, hid the puke in my jacket, climbed up to the balcony, and then, then I made a noise like this. And then I dumped it over the side. Oh, and all the people in the audience, then, then this was horrible. All the people started getting sick and throwing up all over each other. I never felt so bad in my entire life. Mom, they're gonna like this kid, Mom. <laughs> oh, goodness, goodness. You can bring up the house lights again. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm not sure that I could um, teach with that dark like that. That was crazy. It was a little intimidating. But um, man, so many of us, that's like our interrogation. That's what we think it's gonna be like. Our fifth step is an interrogation. We're gonna be interrogated by God. We're interrogated by ourselves because we just went through that, that fourth step and we wrote everything down. And then we think that our sponsor or the person we choose to share our uh, fourth step with is gonna interrogate us. And that's not what it is. It's not an interrogation. So much of recovery gets a bad rap by a lot of things. But remember this. Recovery, it's not about others. It's about you. It's about you. And that, that's a great phrase up there. Is your past still a stumbling block? The things that you have done, is it still a stumbling block? Is it still something that you get hung up on? You maybe have guilt or shame, or maybe there's something that you will never forget. Maybe there's something you're still holding on to, because you're gonna take it to your grave. And that's so difficult to live a life like that. Well, tonight we're talking about confess, and the C in confess is this. It's confess your shortcomings, resentments, and sin. That we would confess those things, our shortcomings. The things that we're not always good at. Confess those things. Then we're gonna confess our resentments. The people that we have a resentment against. Maybe that's God, maybe that's your parents, maybe that's somebody else, but maybe we have that. Our screens are having a hard time tonight, so I'm just gonna keep rolling and you guys just keep filling it in because I don't wanna stop. So here's the deal is uh, resentments and sin. Like I said, this is not about what others have done to you. And I know sitting in this room, there's been a lot of horrible things that have happened to you. And it's not about that. It's not that we don't care, it's not that I'm insensitive to it because I think there's a time and a place that we address those things, we talk about those things, we heal from those things, 
But when we come to the fifth step, it's not for us to confess everything that's happened to us. Because if you do, you stay a victim. And recovery is not about re- remaining a victim. It's about finding victory over being that victim. It's about finding who we are in Christ. And it's about us accepting responsibility for our behaviors, for our resentments, for our sins, for our shortcomings, that we would be able to deal with that, that we would be able to start to find healing, that we would come clean of those things. Most people do, I did this in my relationship with my wife. I'll go personal here. I won't talk theoretical. My relationship with my wife, I was dating her, and uh, I threw out the whole, um, hey, I used to struggle with porn. <laughs> that was awesome. It was a great line, because I was testing the waters to see how she was going to respond. And she kind of responded pretty good, but I still was like, I'm still going to take and hold the fact that I'm still struggling with it. That was how I did it. And so many of us in our recovery, we go to that same thing. I used to do this. Or we shall share part, but we won't share everything. We only deal with part issues, or we'll be so vague about it that we are not detailed and get specific about it. I was talking to a guy the other day, a guy's looking for a job, and I was called to interview him and uh, talking to him a little bit, and uh, it was interesting. He, he kind of was like, well, yeah, I, used to, I, I had an issue, and I looked at something. Well, what does that mean? You looked at something. Like, I see things all the time. Be specific. What did you see? What did you look at? What happened? What was the duration of the time? What was, like, come on, let's get a little bit more specific. And sometimes we gotta be specific about the things that we are dealing with and we have to come clean. See, this is not a forced confession like you saw on there and like you saw maybe in the example of of me coming home, but it's a true confession. One that is admitting that we are wrong and agree with God on the sin in our life. That we admit our stuff. We've already stepped out of denial We've already had a a desire to have this higher power step into our life and and help us, right? Restore us to sanity, right? We've surrendered to him, right? We've already made the list. Take that next step and confess it to God, to yourself, and to someone you trust. That that is God's desire for us. In Psalm chapter 28, verse 13, it says this, people who cover over their sins will not prosper, But if they confess and forsake them, they will receive mercy. Wow. Wow. And unfortunately, I don't think the church has done a great deal to help in that. Because I know some of you, if you're like me, which is in me, I, I, I had confessed. Multiple times in my life growing up in junior high, high school, um, I had confessed my sin. I had shared with youth leaders, hey, this is what I struggle with. And I don't feel like it was received well. It was a go and sin no more. It was a look upon of, oh. And I know I've shared it before. Literally, a youth leader had dropped me off at home and never talked to me again. That was my experience with the church and when I would confess. The church is full of sinful people. And we hurt people. But here's what the word of God says, that when we confess that we receive mercy, that we receive mercy. That's huge. Yeah, okay. I was just making sure that was, that was a different version, but same thing. Sorry. I was like, whoa, that's not the same one. Oh, is this, obey God's directions. Are you obeying God's directions for your life? I heard a yes, that's good. Are we truly obeying those directions? I mean, are we hearing what he said? If we've surrendered to him, are we really following his word, his guidance, the way that he desires for us to to walk? Um, Confession restores our relationship with Jesus. When we have confession, it starts to bridge that gap that happened. I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later. Genesis chapter three, when sin came on this earth, there was a division and a separation between us and God. 
And when we confess, it starts to bridge that gap between us and him. And there's healing that can start to happen in our life. That there can be uh, things that we have done that are so heinous in our mind, and yet God wipes away. Clean. I mean, we are stained like crimson, and we are now wiped away like white as, white as snow, white as wool. How am I to obey Jesus if I have a hindered relationship? If I have resentment against God, how do I have a relationship with him? Some of us are still holding on to that resentment with God. We haven't healed because of maybe people and how they've treated us. I went on a uh, staff retreat to Hume Lake, and one of the, some of the hurt that has happened in my life has happened at Hume Lake Christian Camps. Those were multiple times I had confessed. And I remember going up there for a staff retreat, and I was struggling. I remember going into one of the chapels there. I remember sitting right by the window at which I confessed to a leader, and there was hurt and pain handed to me that night. And I remember sitting there through a whole session, and I couldn't pay attention to what our speaker was talking about. The only thing I knew is I sat there and I held on to my resentment and I stewed and I stewed and I stewed. And then they said, go spend three hours alone with God. And I was like, awesome, where's my phone? I can play some games, but up there you have no reception, so there's nothing you can do at all. And uh, even if you have the Zach Morris phone over there, see that phone? Even if you have that, I can't call anybody. It, so there's nothing, there, there's no reception. So I went and spent time and I sat by the lake and I remember picking up a rock I remember yelling loud as I can, and you guys all know I'm loud. I yelled, I forgive you, and I hucked the rock into the middle of the lake. Well, it wasn't the middle. I like to think it was the middle, but I don't have that good of an arm. But I hucked it into the water, and um, just that power of releasing, that hurt and pain was huge for me. It was huge. But how are you to obey Jesus if you still have a hindered relationship? I mean, he's giving you guidance and, and you're still holding a resentment. How do you hear him? It blocks us being able to hear him. See, James chapter five, verse 16 says this. It says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. We confess so we can be healed. When we walk through the doors, there's so much hurt and pain in our life. And we've said it before, you don't come in these doors on a winning streak. There's hurt and pain in our life. There's a reason why you walked in these doors. When we confess and when we share, we do that so we can start to heal. Because that's what we're wanting. Because there's so much pain that's there. The end and confess is no more guilt. No more guilt. Some of us love to stay in that place of shame. We love to stay in that place of shame. And there's a difference between guilt and shame, right? Guilt is I've done something wrong, I've done something bad. Shame is I am someone wrong, I am someone bad. And there's a difference between that. And there shouldn't be any shame, but this is the process that when you confess these things to God, to yourself, and to someone you trust, that shame falls off your shoulders. That weight is lifted off. But so many of us, we live in that rear view mirror. My daughter just got her license and so taking her through, hey, here's how you drive, looking in mirrors is very important. But if she was to drive down the road only looking in her mirrors, you would have a problem because she'd probably end up running into the back of you, right? That's what happens in life when we live in that rear view mirror. We can't do that. We have to focus on the things ahead of us. And there's things that get caught in my life all the time or there's things that will pop up in my head and I can't get rid of it. There's something that, that came up in my head. There's an old principle. And I remember going to the movie theater and I remember sitting right behind him and he came in and sat down, him and his wife, and I was there and we we're like, hey, Mr. So-and-so, what are you gonna, there's, I think there's a nude scene in this movie. What are you gonna do? And then we realized we were in the wrong theater and I was like, oh, I'm an idiot. And which is the story of my life, right? And so here's the deal, is that small thing, it's not a big deal, but that would trigger every once in a while in my life. And so when that happens, I have to confess that, I have to share that, I have to find forgiveness for those things and work through that in my life. Romans chapter eight, verse one says this, there is now no condemnation for those who are in 
Christ Jesus. And then that follow verse of Romans 3, 23 and 24, and this is kind of abbreviated in there, all have sinned, yet God declares us not guilty. If we trust in Jesus Christ, who freely takes away our sins. All have sinned, yet we're declared not guilty. Do you believe that you're declared not guilty? Or do you still hold on to that conviction? Hmm, something to think about. Well, the lie is over. Now I can stop living the lie and live in the truth. And John Baker says this, the con is over, so it's time to fess up. The con is over, we've done the C-O-N, now it's time to fess up, and that's what we're doing, is we're starting to tell the truth in this. So in honor of John Baker, I had to share that. Um, The F in fess is this, face the truth. Are you ready to face the truth? Are you ready to live honestly? I mean, this is an honest program. We talk about that the first day you get in here, that this is a program of rigorous honesty. Are you willing to live an honest life? Or are you still wanting to hold on to those old lies? Some of us keep relapsing and relapsing and relapsing and relapsing because we don't quite want it yet. We don't really want to live an honest life. We still want to hold on to maybe some of the old patterns, the old way of doing things, half measures. We want to take the shorter, simpler route. We don't want to do the work, right? If I do part of the fourth step, I'll see if it maybe partly works in my life but we don't go through it all the way. We don't fully commit. We don't fully be all in. Are you all in? If you're all in, let's go all in. Face the truth. Let's start living an honest life. To not have secrets. To not hold something back. To be 100% honest with your spouse. Yeah. I heard that. Mm. Yeah, exactly, right? I know. That's rough. Because... In my relationship with my wife, that's all she wants. She wants me to live an honest life. And then I'm a bonehead, and I try to do something sneaky because that's my old way of doing things, my character defects, and it always comes back to bite me in the butt. And I have to go make amends, and I have to go, you're right, and step back out into truth. Same thing happens with God. John chapter 8, verse 12 says this. Jesus said to the people, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't be stumbling through the darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. We stumble around in darkness and lies, hiding in secrets. And here's the thing, we can't do that. We can't do that. I was thinking of the Transformers, man. So many of us are like those Transformers and we try to blend into the crowd so we transform into what everybody else is doing. Instead of living an honest life of who we are, being honest with that. And when we do, we stop stumbling around because we have the light that leads us to life. And so many of us have been the walking dead for so long. And it's time to live in the light. Is there another verse that came after that? I thought there was. Nope, okay, move on. Uh, Ease the pain. The E in Fess is ease the pain. That when you do this, that pain subsides, that pain that you have felt, that gut-wrenching hurt and pain inside of you eases. I remember the movie um, Field of Dreams. You remember that movie? It's probably, it was made in the 80s, probably, like a lot of this stuff up here. And the first one was, if you build it, he will come. The second one was, ease his pain. Ease his pain. We get our pain eased when we start to confess and we live truthfully and honestly. We are only as sick as our secrets. And some of us are pretty stinking sick right now. When I share this, when we share this sin, when we share our stuff, we divide the pain and the shame, the pain and the guilt. We divide that. We separate that. Psalm chapter 32, verses three through five, and I have a different translation, but I wanna read your translation. There was a time when I wouldn't admit what a sinner I was, but my dishonesty made me miserable and filled my days with frustration. My strength evaporated like water on a sunny day until I finally admitted all my sins to you 
and stop trying to hide them. I said to myself, I will confess them to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. This is King David, the man after God's own heart, that when he was holding on to his secret, when he was holding on to his junk, what happened? All his strength was sucked out of him. How many of us, myself included, did I try to keep hiding, keep wearing the mask, make sure that people around me don't find my stash, they don't know who I really am, they don't know what I was just doing, they don't know that I try to hide it, deceive them, manipulate them. But when I confess, God forgives us and our guilt is gone. How huge is that? Not only is it, does it ease the pain, but it also stops the blame. Ease the pain, stops the blame. Genesis chapter three, Eve, Adam, and a serpent are chilling in the garden, right? Hanging out, things are great, things are amazing, and... Uh, Serpent talks to the woman. The woman talks to the man. Next thing we know, they've eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and now there is a separation. They're hide. They realize they're naked. <laughs> I have a story about that too. I remember. I won't go there. Add. Sorry. Um, <laughs> ask me later. I'll tell you the story. But here's the deal: is they realize they're naked. All of a sudden, they go and they make clothes for themselves, and then they hear God walking in the garden. And they freak out, and there's automatically guilt, shame, they're hiding, they're separated, and God goes, who told you you were naked? <laughs> well, I can see, but yes, exactly. There's things that, that obviously were there. And since that day, there's been a separation from us and God. But since that day, it has only been God's desire that we would be reunited, reunited with him, and there would be unity between us. And he's given us that path through Jesus Christ. He's given it through, and we sang about that. But we have been isolated long enough in our addiction. Let's start to bring unity and connection back into relationships. And if you don't have a sponsor, you don't have accountability partners, you don't have the phone numbers of the people in your open share group, get them tonight and start to use them. It is amazing what happens when we use the tools that we've been given. I got a call from a struggling buddy today and it was amazing to be able to talk to him because when I talked to him, even though I wasn't the one that made the phone call, guess what happens? I even get to help myself and I strengthen my own recovery. You can't keep it unless you give it away. And that is a huge part of our process. Have meetings with people throughout the week. I've got a couple meetings that I go to throughout a week that are just for accountability to talk to. I go to some other outside meetings to help me in my recovery. You start to build those things, and when we do that, we begin to have intimacy in not only those relationships, but all our relationships. The relationship with our spouse gets better. The relationship with our parents get better. The relationship with our children start to get better. It's absolutely crazy. I know there's tough times along the road, but when we work the program, when we apply these biblical principles to our life, there is healing that begins to happen. Genesis 3.12 says this. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate it. And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. And then the next verse, next slide. That wasn't it, doggone it. There, I must have deleted it. Man, I'm all over the place tonight. But here's the thing. It goes on that the, the man blames the woman. The woman blames the serpent and God punishes them all. How many of us do we blame for our own behaviors? I drink because of this, because of you. I look at pornography because of, if you would only this, if you would only that, I wouldn't cheat on you of this. You made me do it. You shouldn't have had that chocolate cake in the house. You shouldn't have opened the bag of Oreos. I was good when they were sealed, but once you opened them, it was like opening the floodgates of, um, exactly, that's what happens. 
Matthew chapter seven, verse three says this. I'm gonna use that translation up there, so we're gonna go with it. Get there, there you go. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your own eye. I'm getting back to that. Uh, then perhaps you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. That we, instead of sitting down and playing the victim and sitting on the pity pot, what do we do? We take ownership of our stuff. And when we take ownership of our stuff, we're getting that, that log out of our own eye. And let's let our neighbors deal with a speck that's in their eye. And that's really difficult when that neighbor is your spouse. And their dysfunction is affecting your home. That is really difficult. So go to COCA or go to COSA groups and find encourage strength and hope in there uh, with that. The last S is this, start accepting God. Start accepting God. I don't know what happened there. That's my typo. That one was my typo. Start accepting God. We just abbreviate it to accepting God. <laughs> So I'm trying to make that word happen. But <laughs> accepting God, accept my mistakes and my shortcomings. This obviously is one of them. Thank you. I'm confessing that now. But start accepting God. I mean, some of us can't even accept God. We can't even accept the work that he's done on the cross. We can't accept that there's a God that would actually love us for who are, we are. Because we feel like no one else can. And we can't even love ourselves for who we are. But there is a God that loves you for who you are. There's a God that cares about you and wants a relationship with you. There's a God that has actually forgiven you and has given you grace. There's a God that even when you have sobriety and you stumble and you fall and you relapse, there's a God that still loves you, forgives you, and pours out his grace and mercy upon you. Accepting that God it's huge. There's two passages out of uh, Corinthians I wanna read. The first one is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. That God, through Jesus, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That he was able to help us reconcile with God. Remember that division that happened in Genesis 3 that I just talked about? He, we are now reconciled back with him. And when we reconcile with him, there's great things that happen. And then the 12th step, you can't keep it unless you give it away. We go share that same message with other people that are struggling in the areas of our addiction. So we go talk to, I go talk to other sex addicts. I go talk to other food addicts. Because that's what God has called me to do. And I don't know what area of recovery you're in, but God has called you to start talking to other addicts or other codependents or other people who are hurting in a similar area as you so that you can find healing through Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse nine. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more of my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. God's grace is sufficient for you. When you can't forgive yourself, let God's grace help you through that process. When somebody else has hurt you so deeply, they've molested you, they've raped you, they've done horrible things, they've beat you. I was watching Friday Night Lights, the movie last night, and in that movie there's a dad in there that's absolutely abusive. My heart breaks every time there's that scene. There's tons of scenes where he's beating him. My heart breaks. When we have somebody like that in our life, it's hard to forgive. But we let God and his grace flow through us so that we may be able to forgive them. That's huge. So guys, confess. 
Now tonight, when you go to open share group, share your experience, strength, and hope, how you've applied, confessed to your recovery. Some of you may have that burning desire because I just talked about confess and you got that one big sin and you're just gonna vomit it in group. Awesome, use wisdom. Maybe talk to somebody afterwards um, because in this process, remember we're on the fifth step and I'm not gonna confess everything in front of you guys in a large group, but I do have a couple people that know everything about my life. Be selective in who you choose to allow to be a part of this process. We've already gone over that through our sponsor lesson. Why don't you guys stand? We'll close our time with the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever the next. Amen. Amen, amen. Hey, first time guest right across the hallway, second time guest, come on up front if you're on Zoom. I encourage you to watch tonight, join a Zoom group, and then get down here in person next week. Love you guys. See you later.